morning, and uh, what an impressive group of people. Uh, it's in, in the work that a lot of us here in Washington do on a daily, weekly, whatever basis, uh, you know, we forget how uh, our work actually touches everybody, we hope nationally, to see uh, the, this group of qualified people from all over the country is quite impressive. Um, and thank you for participating. It's a really, it's, 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 I, I can't tell you enough how, how impressed I am by this group and for your participation. Thanks also to the Caroline and the, and the you know, Mall Trust for taking this on. It's something that really needs to happen. Um, one of the themes here is this is a, our, our culture, our, our country, everything, it, there's, it's always marked by change. And this is a new phase that we're going into about how we manage this landscape and what we're going to do with it. So that's just a sort of a background. Just very quickly, I am the secretary of the Commission of Fine Arts, which is a 101-year-old body established uh, about halfway through the history of the mall. Um, it, is a, it is a body of seven presidential appointed experts in the arts who consider uh, the designs of all public projects in the District of Columbia, among other things, but basically dedicated to the quality of national symbols. Uh, it com comes out of a sort of a, of, of, an, of, a, of a political idea a uh, hundred years ago of progressivism uh, and, and uh, uh, the idea of having experts that can, can uh, make these recommendations. Uh, but we've been working at it for 101 years. I'd like to recognize Diana Balmori, who's in our audience, who sits on the commission. Um, I was asked to do this, uh, and understanding that this is a short period of time in which to relate the history of, of two centuries, please forgive the fact that I'm going to be traveling at a fairly high elevation and touching very shallowly on issues which are actually fairly complex. There's a lot of people here in the audience who know this material very well, far better than I. Uh, so I'm going to try, I hope this is helpful to you. There's a range of, of backgrounds here, but I think it's important to understand a little bit about how this landscape has evolved. Uh, I'm not going to be focusing on uh, you're going to be getting into a lot of issues about the mall plan itself and the sites. So uh, I'm just going to be trying to give you the, the background. Um, and uh, I'd like to also cite uh, my staff member, Kay Fanning, who's here, formerly with the National Park Service, now the Historian Ethic Commission. She has done a lot of work uh, as a researcher and writer from uh, cultural landscape reports and uh, will be available potentially if there's a little, if there's questions afterwards uh, at the end of the presentation. So to begin, um, yeah, I, I'd like to just emphasize that this really has evolved. It always was conceived, the National Mall as a symbolic landscape. Uh, it's already turned off because I've talked too much. Uh, which one? Um, left and right, okay. Um, always from the beginning. Um, it has evolved. Uh, from a path in various ways. It was conceived of uh, it by L'Enfant, uh, but over, over many centuries in, in, in various movements has, has changed in use and, and image, pastoral, gardenesque, industrial, iconographic, recreational, a place for political expression, a place for commemoration. It's important to remember that this is a highly constructed landscape, much of it actually built on reclaimed land from what we now refer to as wetlands. Often in the past, we would have re been referred to as a swamp. Um, it's been an extremely malleable landscape. It's one that has changed. Its borders change. Uh, this is another issue that we'll be talking about. What is the mall? Uh, I'm not going to get into the nomenclature, but it's obviously something that's subject to changes recently as about uh, three weeks ago. Uh, what is in or with outside the mall? The uses on the mall have changed considerably over time, and they're informed by our own culture and technology. For example, telecommunication and the advent of radio, television, the automobile and mass transportation. Uh, these have all changed enormously the use of the mall in the 20th century, and in the 21st century we'll be looking at a whole new set of uh, changes, particularly with IT, the internet, possibly with um, new, new uh, consciousness of, of ecology. Fundamentally, though, we're talking about the mall is a very, very big idea for this country. 
and I'm not here to define exactly what that idea is, but I think that you can uh, bring that to, uh, to your, uh, you can provide it for yourselves. Uh, but because it's such a big and sometimes abstract idea, it's, uh, the, the devil is often in the details. And so one of the things that we'll be seeing is it's the reconciliation of the idea with the physical reality, the tension between competition for uses uh, uh, against that big idea. Uh, so, uh, again, to, to turn really, this is our this is what we sort of consider our branding shot for the commission. Notice that uh, the the central the starring role is often the Washington Monument, and that's something that'll be recurring. Um, it's a symbolic landscape. It seems timeless. It seems almost magical. You see it in an image like this, and it's it's uh, it, it resonates and seems to have uh, exist almost outside of history. But the fact is, is that it's constantly changing. The mall as we know it did not exist as recently as 1979, in terms of how, basically how we think of these pieces. So it's it's constantly changing. And, and now I'm going to go all the way back to the very beginning and talk about uh, the, the origins. Obviously, the the uh, national capital established in 1790. Immediately, there was a concern about creating a capital city with uh, uh, these asp political aspirations that were based in classical antiquity. Um, Washington, obviously, uh, being a landowner across the river, knew about this location. They identified this area at the uh, confluence of the um, two branches of the Potomac River, a particular little creek uh, called Goose Creek, um, emptying out into a little broad plain against a sort of a headland at the east and a rise to the north. I'm going to just show you here if you can see. This is the Potomac. This is Goose Creek a kind of a rise here and then a, bit, a headland over here. Goose Creek was promptly renamed Ti the Tiber Creek for obvious reasons. Um, this is actually Jefferson's own sketch talking uh, about what he might have imagined. We were, we were a little, just a little bit of an array here. This is actually the White House. The, the, the Capitol is actually today over here, the White House somewhere over here. But and you can see this sort of modest little idea. We were joking earlier that it really just looks like a plan for an orchard with a couple of trees. The scale's a little bit deceiving, but Jefferson himself uh, was very interested in this. And then, of course, uh, Washington had hired um, L'Enfant to do a survey who quickly came up with some very interesting ideas about applying a, a, a wonderful idea. And everybody knows the story of the L'Enfant plan, but just in the very briefest words, a commemorative structure to the city itself marrying the topography with points of, of civic interest. This is rotated uh, 45 degrees, so of course south is this way, north this way. The topographic bowl described Tiber Goose or Tiber Creek. The idea for the capital here, if I can see that correctly, right here at this little bluff overlooking this great space a rise in the elevation here for the great cross axis, which was defined eventually by the White House here. Um, you can see that what the mall would become is a lot of it is actually estuary. This is the map of dotted lines. Um, eventually, it all, of course, it all had to be drawn up and made possible. And again, I wanted to show, this is a, late, a slightly later map called the, the, the Dermot Plan, but it really shows the extent this is, a, this is basically done for the sale of lots later on, but you can see the extent of all this, this water, Capitol being just off the map, White House President's Park here. Uh, this is actually our nascent mall landscape. Um, Ellicott actually uh, uh, did a survey of the 10 miles squared. Of course, the, again, part of the genius of the plan, this is again rotated 45 degrees. They were, the, the, the legislation called for a 10 mile square near the confluence of these rivers. And what was so great about this plan is that they made, by turning it sideways, they sort of centered it on this, this sort of flat plain here, surrounded by these, uh, this, is, this is actually geologically the fall line of the East Coast, where the, the Piedmont gives way to the coastal plain, so you have the confluence of rivers. We have a navigable river coming up from the ocean, the Chesapeake Bay, all the way up. The, the, the Anacostia was quite navigable up to Bladensburg and over to Georgetown. And there was an existing port at Alexandria, 
Georgetown and then up river. So by turning the map diagonally, it managed to enclose, you know, capture all those little economic areas and create a quite a quite a lovely composition. But then of course the focus of the settlement was here in what was really the, the flatter part of the city. Um, this, of course, the famous uh, engraving, 1792, this is the Ellicott version of the plan uh, showing, again, the mall landscape now. You, 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 they've turned the Tiber Creek now into a working, uh, so the idea was to actually create a canal. The creek actually came down here, really roughly where the train line comes in from New York. Some of you may have come through there this morning. It emptied over here. This, of course, created a, a, a canal, which was both for commerce and uh, sewage, which would go all the way down here to the Anacostia. The Navy Yard established over here on the Anacostia, as well as a wharf at 17th Street. It's a close up here. Um, I just want to show you a couple of these. This is the this is the mall as we know it. The Capitol on the hill, looking over the canal in the foreground. The President's House again, right down to the water here. Tiber Creek now. Pr proposed to be canalized. A couple of interesting points just uh, to show you how far back in time these concepts go. Letter A, A, the first thing is an enormous equestrian statue, I said an equestrian statue of George Washington, basically a, a large monument, and its idea is to be at the crossing of these two axes and connecting the Congress with the executive mansion. And, uh, other elements, of course, the President's Mansion, the Capitol over here, we've got at the base of the Capitol, uh, a cascade, a great fountain. Of course, this is the head Tiber Creek coming down. It would, could have been, um, you know, actually the, the, the pressure ahead of whatever might have been coming down was actually, a, it, was, it was a reasonable engineering idea to, to create a cascade here at this, at this low area. H is really our area of interest, a grand avenue, four, 400 feet in breadth, uh, bordered with gardens, ending in the slope, and then of course it comes down to the water itself. Now originally, by this time you're seeing the shaping of the landscape, which would have been much more irregular than opening out here. The actual area of the crossing for the big monument, uh, you know, a lot of this was, was, was actually terra firma at that point. Which way am I pointing that? This is a, another, uh, uh, another um, engraving of the same period, uh, showing the same idea a little bit. This, this is a li shows a little bit more asymmetrical treatment of these pieces. There was a lot of engravings that were done at the time. Such a big, uh, such a big enterprise, this new city, and a, a lot of interest here and abroad. This actually takes Ellicott's plan, which is a, a slight simplification of the L'Enfant plan, and created um, this whole space. There is ideas that there would be. Um, foreign embassies and, and places. In, in some extent, it's really a model. I think the, the, the idea is modeling it on basically an 18th century pleasure garden, a place for, for promenading um, and uh, walking, possibly carriage rides. The early 19th century and actually into the mid-19th century uh, is kind of a period, a period of latency for what happens on the mall. It, it's actually given over to a lot of uh, agricultural and, and other uh, garden-esque uses. Um, this is a view, perhaps a little bit um, uh, optimistic, from Georgetown. Uh, this is, you can see, if you, if you know the topography, this is basically Georgetown. This is uh, Observatory Hill, Mason's Island, Anna Austin Island, also Teddy Roosevelt Island, coming across. These are the Anacostia Hills, the, the city, and the city. I, I don't think anybody sort of perceives uh, that we have such large... Uh, hills here, but I think that that was that was. Uh, but it gives you some idea of the character of the area. This uh, now is uh, from the 1830s across from those Anacostia Hills, looking back at the city. Again, somewhat exaggerating perhaps the the elevation, but the Capitol on that bluff, the White House on that rise. Of course, it's not. It's really only um, probably. Somebody might know this. Is it about 30 feet above sea level? 20. Uh, this is much higher. Uh, this is the Navy Yard there on the Anacostia, deep water for shipbuilding. You can see the big, sh the big structure for, for shipbuilding. And of course, then the other working waterfront along the channel. This, uh, the capital from the northeast, again, Tiber Creek would be on your right. 
uh, basically where, and, and somewhere down in here, Union Station. Again, a little topographic thing is that all Union Station, the whole rail line, was elevated some 35 feet uh, eventually, it's 100, 100 years later. So there's an immense uh, manipulation of the landscape here. The Capitol itself at the base of Pennsylvania Avenue. This is Bullfinch's dome. This is from 1832. Um, you can see that it was a very green city. I think it was also a very muddy city. Uh, I think that Pennsylvania Avenue was paved in, in wood. Um, a lot of the modern uh, amenities of, of the city didn't come in until much later in the 19th century. But you can see that its character as very green was always there. Now, how much of that was for lack of development? I don't know. It's a, it's a question for uh, historians. The truth was is that there was an enormous amount of speculation and then a lack of development, a lot of it clustering around closer to the White House. And then, of course, Capitol. This is a view of the White House itself. The Potomac Estuary, Tiber Creek, really close there in the foreground literally just a few hundred yards away. So you can see how different that is from, to, from current conditions. <coughs> the most important thing, to return back to that monument, uh, in 1836, I believe, uh, there, there was a national competition for the monument. Remember capital letter A on the L'Enfant Plan. Um, this was Robert Mills, who was the most prominent architect who'd come here in his 30s and did, did some, some of our most important mid-century, mid-19th century buildings. Uh, this was an enormous obelisk, again, drawing on precedents which go far, far back in, in Western history. Uh, this becomes perhaps the most significant and powerful idea for the mall that will take hold over another century or more but the, the creation of this. And of course, as everybody knows, it was begun in the 1840s and not completed due to all sorts of strife internally, uh, political infighting, eventually the Civil War. It was left as a stump for some 40 years. Uh, this is basically uh, on the eve of the Civil War. Uh, Thomas Eustick Walter's Capitol Dome being constructed. You can see the foreground here, this is basically where Union Square is, had become the Capitol Botanical Garden under the jurisdiction of the Capitol, interestingly. Uh, this is, the, uh, this is the, the, the Tiber Creek Canal. You can see it's actually got, there's a barge here in the foreground. So it was actually a functioning thing and wound its way through the city. Uh, at, again, at this time, we're seeing then, you know, due to the benefactor, uh, uh, Smithson from England, who, who endowed the, the, the incredible uh, Smithsonian Institution, uh, they built the castle right on the mall in the eight, uh, 1840s. Again, this is, this is a departure now. We're, not, we're no longer drawing on our classical precedents, but we've got a sort of an academic bent. We're getting into that, I think, what becomes collegiate Gothic. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, the, you, but you can see the setting within this very uh, uh, picturesque landscape, of course, supported in a few years by a proposal by Al Downing uh, for the mall. It's a little bit, uh, this is sort of upside down and backwards. And there's the capitals here, White House here, the Smithsonian itself uh, over here. So if you think about it that way, it's a very... Uh, it's not it's not the linear idea that you saw before on the on the the um, Montfont plan it's a very sort of lush sinuous landscape and working in various elements the botanical garden the the Smithsonian complex um, all the way over here to now the, the the Washington monument right there and down to the river's edge um, and it really set the tone I believe for a sensibility about how the mall would be developed for then for the next several generations all the way through the 19th century. By the Civil War and into the end of the century, Washington really modernized and came out of what was really a period of somewhat under, under development and the national, I think the, the Civil War probably strengthened enormously the, the national government, but also there was enormous change in governance of the city. Uh, beginning with the, there was a, uh, a new mayor uh, form of government in the 1870s. They did enormous work under a guy named Alexander Boss Shepard to, re to pave the streets, plant trees, to, uh, put in sewers, all the modern ideas which, which created infrastructure for the city actually to be a modern capital in, by the 19th century. And it became 
Washington became a very known as a very leafy, lush, uh, convenient city, and because of its uh, really international and political power, uh, started to become a kind of a favorite place uh, for for some society people to to winter here, especially those who couldn't quite make it in New York. It was considered a place for the for the aspirants to uh, show up. Uh, but the the war, of course, in the in, in the first place had a big impact physically on the mall. This is this is during the war. You can see a, a, a little train here. A, a rail has actually been imposed right there. We've got streetcars. We've got the completed dome. Uh, you can um, see the, the old Capitol gates here, which would shortly be relocated. Uh, hospital right on the mall. This is the, uh, the arm. Oops, excuse me. How did I do that? All right, uh, hospital right here on the mall. Uh, this is the, or the armory. Uh, we've got the capital in the foreground, I mean in the background. Um, all sorts of uses during war. And we'll find this theme of the mall being used in wartime uh, is always one of those tensions that happens. Um, shortly thereafter, the Department of, of uh, Agriculture uh, was given a space right on the mall, probably because they needed open space to do their various um, got greenhouses, they've got uh, all sorts of uh, various, they've got fisheries over here. This is actually designed by the, the German uh, immigrant architect Adolf Kloos um, in the late 60s. It actually stood there on the mall until I believe the 1932, something like that, or early 30s. Uh, again, inf big impact, f f other than the Smithsonian, the other first major uh, building on the mall, and it's the first and last executive department building, probably because of the enormous imp importance of agriculture in the national economy at the time. It's something to remember is that in the 19th century, the biggest single, uh, you know, you know, most of the American employment was involved with agriculture. Now, of course, the story of the late 19th century is incredible industrialization and the growth uh, where, where the U.S. starts as one of the lowest, you know, in its class of, of industrial nations and by the turn of the century is has far out ex exceeding Germany and France and Britain to everybody's astonishment there's an enormous um, economic development but there were still here in 18 the late late 60s moving into the 1870s and and so we just got this very basic idea uh, but the train you know all this industrialization is starting to come the train station this is the Baltimore Potomac um, station right on the mall uh, so we've got streetcars um, the Smithsonian uh, begins its its uh, 150 years of expansion. Uh, we've got the National, <laughs> also by close, uh, the National uh, Museum built in the early 1880s, and this, of course, is something that, that is right next to uh, it's 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 one of those properties that's hotly contested as to what its future might be. So, by the 1880s, you know, we, this is sort of a, a nice little Courier and Ives uh, view show, or it, uh, the truth is, it's probably a little bit later. Uh, we've got the, we've got the, the, the White House with the, the State War and Navy building already built. Uh, the Capitol, obviously, this very clear relationship, somewhat exaggerated. Uh, the Washington Monument not yet completed, although its reflection in the water apparently is. Um, <laughs> and, and, but, but what's what's of course fascinating is how this this landscape has developed. You know, it, we've got the President's Park with these undulating elements. We've got these remnants of the canal, uh, the agriculture complex, the Sasonian area. We've got the rail station, the Capitol Botanic Gardens. It's it's a bit of a sequence of spaces, a bit of a hodgepodge. It doesn't mean that it wasn't without it's some sort of coherence, as as a you know as a as a leafy. Um, garden-esque landscape, but it certainly did not necessarily relate the great big idea that we're known, that we know about today. At the same time, oops, I keep switching here, uh, jurisdiction started to be established. The, uh, the Office of Public Buildings and Grounds was established around this time uh, and really started to manage these areas. Uh, this, is, this, is, this just shows these sequences of, of administrative units established by the OPBG uh, is overlaid on a modern plan, but you can understand how these pieces were. You know, they've got all these great names that, you know, 
uh, we've got Seton Park East and the agriculture grounds and Henry Park. There's, these are sort of, a lot of these have actually been lost. But uh, this, the, the, idea, the, the idea I'm trying to get across is that it's still a sequence of spaces. So 1880s, back to our theme of the star, the star of the show, uh, the Washington Monument really, its completion in 1885 was an enormous uh, change. And I think as Kirk Savage has, has written in his last book, it really set the stage for a new level of scale and abstraction and symbolism that wasn't, that had never been realized before. And by creating this 555 foot obelisk in the middle of the city, which can be seen, by the way, from miles and the heights of Georgetown, you can see it from Petworth. I mean, it's, it's, it's really an amazing structure in it. And it really becomes this element which starts to organize the symbolic arrangement of the city. Um, another thing I want to point out to you in this photograph, really important, is this dredging operation going on this is the Potomac in the background. The dredging, which was done f partially for shipping and for the canal, uh, I mean, for the, for the, for the, for the, in the river, the channel, um, they had to put the dirt somewhere. And they started, to, the Army Corps, of Engineers, as Army Corps of Engineers actually started to create a lot of artificial land fill on the swamps of East Potomac Park. So this becomes part of this landscape story of the mall as it extends out from what we really call the historic mall, 3rd to, to 14th Street. Um, this is the, uh, and again, an upside down map. This is the Washington Monument Grounds. Here it is. This is the north 16th Street axis. Um, the remnant of some of these wetlands, you know, is that these are, these are actually uh, fish ponds. Uh, and you can see that landscape right there. I think that the monument is visible in that picture, but I can't, I can't remember. Um, so you're starting to get... Uh, you know, uh, this, uh, a, a new you know, extension of that picturesque landscape here. This is landfill of East Potomac Park, very late in the century or around 1900. All, this is the Washington Channel on the left. This is basically land that has been built up over the last 30 years and, and um, is starting to be realized, although I, some would argue it's never quite been realized. Uh, this, this is a view from the Washington Monument looking to the north, west, northwest towards Georgetown would be over here. Oh, uh, you can see the Kennedy Center right there, can't you? This is, this, <laughs> this is, uh, this is the Roosevelt Island and this is um, Roslyn, Virginia. Nothing, nothing is here. We got the, the, uh, we don't, the Memorial Bridge, uh, Lincoln Memorial. So you can see this was a, this is a, this is a landscape waiting to happen. It wasn't even clear, I understand, that they were going to give it over to park purposes, that it could have even been developed commercially. But in the end, uh, the idea was to, to uh, continue that as part of the landscape. This again, a view from the top of the monument looking back to the Capitol. Again, this incredible, I love this photograph. I mean, you're gonna see, I'm going to show it you three times, I think. Uh, foreground, this is all this, this, this washing, the, the, the uh, agriculture building and its dependencies. This, this great sort of forecourt. This is the, the Smithsonian, this wild kind of place. Here's that train station we were talking about. And then, of course, getting over here, we get into the Capitol Botanical Gardens, the Capitol itself. So you can see. Uh, a very lush, an amazing sort of, sort of uh, continuous landscape, if not one that is necessarily conceptually or formally connected, but it has a certain uh, uh, character. So by the end of the, tw of the 19th century, again, I had talked about the fact that the United States had really grown enormously since the Civil War. And there was actually an idea that we really needed to be presenting the United States in a new light, one which was commensurate with, the, with its new place in the world as a world power. It was actually after the Spanish War in the 1890s. It inherited the remnants of the Spanish overseas empire, Cuba, Philippines, um, basically Caribbean, and, and then, of course, became really dominant in the, in the southern hemisphere, of, uh, in, in, the, in the South America. So a lot of people thought, you know, it's probably... Uh, it, 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 an idea of actually representing that landscape on this national mall in a way that reflected uh, its, these new realities. Uh, one idea, I think, there's a, there a number of people thinking about this right around 1900. We've got one idea. Oh, I guess I, uh, I meant to say that, of course, the impact of the Chicago Fair was enormous in terms of creating an image uh, of, of an imperial grandeur which 
I think, again, was an aspiration of the American politic to to think really big that we were that this country was actually the successors to the Roman Empire in terms of its its power, its longevity, its its grandeur. This, of course, uh, organized and designed in part by um, Daniel Burnham and associates who will come up in our story immediately. Um, so uh, this was, uh, of course, a huge number. A th I believe a third of the American populace came to that fair. Is that, does that sound right? Uh, you have to, it's, it's hard to imagine, I think, for us today to see these grand buildings and so much of it at once um, that I think it blew people's minds. I think, pe you know, the, the stories, if you've read the Eric Larson's The White City, I think the, the anecdotally people coming there, seeing the, these huge white buildings decorated with electric lights for the first time, this monumental cloud breaking down emotionally just because of the, the sheer impact of this statement. And, and others would say, that, of course, the, 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 the famous quip is that it set back American architecture for 50 years. But uh, that's another story. Uh, in any case, enormous influence. So people thinking about this, this was an idea of perhaps continuous westward expansion. I think of these ovals as going all the way out and encompassing you know, all of California if you just keep going. <laughs> but this, is, this was, a, this was a, an interesting plan by a guy named Parsons. This is the, the, the capital just moving on out. <laughs> White House right over here. Uh, Glenn Brown was uh, the, a local architect here uh, and also the national president of the AIA. And he organized the, the national convention here in 1900 um, and had all sorts of ideas about really advocating for changing this landscape. Uh, this is a little bit more restrained idea about that, more of an idea of parterres that he produced. But what Brown's influence and among other people led to was the creation of the Macmillan Commission in the Senate to actually make a study. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to encapsulate so much detail in a, just a few words. I'm just going to talk about these two people, Daniel Burnham on the left, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. on the right, uh, with McKim and Augustus St. Gaudens. Uh, those were the team that, that actually created the Macmillan Plan, which basically the best minds uh, arguably in the country to work on this. They, these are people who'd come from the fair, from the Chicago fair, and designed this new idea for the American landscape. This is 1901. They go on a study tour in the summer of 1901. They visit Versailles, London, Paris, uh, Rome, all the big sites, and they come up with an amazing plan, which is notable, I think, primarily. Everybody's seen these images, and I just it's hard to look at them with, with new eyes, but I think the important thing is to remember the incredible the, the, the formal purity and the coherence of this plan applied onto what is really a kind of a mess in a way. I mean, it's, got, it's, it's, it's actually, I think, beautiful on the ground, but it doesn't have that next level of scale and abstraction. So what we've got here is a reintroduction of this linear space, a very, very important node around the crossing, trying to, always trying to reconcile the, the mismatch between the axis and the actual placement of the monument, which was moved, I think, because I think we, the understanding is because of soil conditions. Uh, the extension of this whole geometry, again, the, 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 the axis has been, has been cranked slightly to, to center on the monument, and then extended all the way to the edge here with this incredible formal garden, really derived from the hunting lodge and designs of uh, Versailles, a big formal element at the end side of the Lincoln Memorial, uh, something here, tidal basin area, uh, uh, monument to the to the founding fathers. Again, this image, everybody's seen it. But think about it. If you go back in time, you kind of if you're flying at a national airport, how different, just at a glance, is that? So there's a couple of things to remember. One is I can't believe they built it because they kind of did. Um, the second is there's a, there's a couple of, there's a lot of layers here. But what's what's another interesting idea is how it stands out. Maybe this is a rendering technique. Maybe there's another principle here. There's a really strong idea about framing, and about creating this almost ethereal landscape formed by these incredibly monumental white buildings, and then this 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 sort of Elysian landscape within with, with these temples. So it's it's a very compelling image. It's actually it's so aspirational. It sort of knocks your socks off if you think about what it looked like back in the day. So instead of the hodgepodge, there's our picture again, you get order. And of course, the monument grounds there in the foreground and, and, a, and, a, and a lesion landscape 
including sheep. But we have room for triumphalism. This is very reminiscent, uh, I think, of the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. We have a civic plaza, a monument to the, to the founding fathers here. This is at the south end of the 16th Street axis where the Jefferson Memorial now stands. And of course, where the city meets the landscape at the base of the Capitol, we have an enormous civic plaza called Union Square. So again, the remarkable thing was that it, it was actually, it, it took 70 years, but they actually implemented it. The first, the first 30 years were actually really important. By 1910, you can see the, that it's already beginning. The National Museum is designed along these classical lines. This is, our old, this is our old agriculture building, but the new agriculture building with its wings, big argument over that. They actually made them tear it down and move it back. This sets this new line for that, that 400, what is now a 445 foot uh, right away across the middle, the new Freer Gallery, the castle still visible. But you can see this slowly, this thing is being transformed from the edges to the inside. This is a view, again, from the Macmillan Report, looking west. That's the a site for the Lincoln Memorial. Dense planting of trees. You'll see that idea taken up again. That's uh, and with, the, with, the mount, with the island behind. This is the Lincoln Memorial under construction. Again, the Lincoln Memorial, it's a huge story all by itself and worthy of, you know, uh, uh, well, many books. But I guess the important thing is to remember this was reclaimed land on swamp land, and the whole idea of the of this temple is that it's on a mound. It's this incredible approach, and if you've ever actually walked it, it's a really moving experience. You start slow, you get steeper, you get very steep, and then suddenly you're there looking up at this man and and his you know you're, and it's really an incredible sort of sort of experience. It's both it's 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 intellectual, but it's also incredibly physical. Well, to create the mound. They had to build a concrete superstructure, 60 feet tall, on top of this con on top of this gravel fill, which itself was another 20 feet above the original water. So this is an incredible manipulation of the landscape. That, by the way, there is a cavern in that space underneath there, which is I've I've been in there once, and it's really amazing. You can barely see the roof or the ceiling. Uh, again, there it is in its splendid isolation. Anchoring the end of the mall. This is, you know, this is 1922. I mean, there are people, uh, you who would have, you know, could still remember this. This is just, just, you know, it. So, you know, it took a lot of work to actually get there. Uh, this is the dedication, but again, it's, you know, so you can sort of see our mound now is being completed. This is a view actually pulling out uh, also from the, I think, the 20s. Now, of course, that tension between the wartime uses and, and, the, and the park, you know, the commemorative uses, you know, they, Frank, th there was, a, there was a sec assistant secretary of the Navy who approved uh, a lot of, you know, they really needed this Navy space during the war, and that, his, his name was Franklin D. Roosevelt at the time, and he, he approved that. He, he said later it was his greatest regret. But um, you can see, though, that literally they've actually started to establish this. We've got the, r the, the rainbow, p I mean, the, the, the reflecting pool, the rainbow pool. This actually must be from the, about 1930, uh, in the late 20s. We've got the circle here, the extension of Constitution Avenue all the way to the edge. Still haven't built the Memorial Bridge. But you can see now the tidal basin. This is that East Potomac Park. The Washington Channel this is a wonderful view. Uh, the, even the National, I think that's the National Academy of Sciences right there. So we're, it's starting to hit. So but literally into the 20s, this landscape's actually starting to come up. So that really certain aspects of it are, have become tourist attractions. Um, you know, we have this idea of these little temples in the woodland. That's actually this wonderful vignette from the Macmillan plan. It's realized with the District War Memorial. This is an early 30s designed by Horace Peasley. It's recently been um, renovated, so I urge you to go look at it. It's really fabulous. But it was used also as, it was the idea of a living memorial set in the woods, used as a band shell. So it's, it's, it's not just commemoration, it's actually this mix of park and, and, and commemorative with recreational use. This is the Tidal Basin Edge. The, the, the cherry trees start going in in 1912, I believe. Um, and it's, yeah, it's exactly 100 years. In fact, we're looking at a new Japanese lantern setting on our agenda at the commission next week. Um, 
but it becomes it becomes a, a tourist attraction uh, already, and you're you're starting to see this inc this this uh, great development. Washington Monument grounds here, the fish ponds given over possibly to these uh, fountain jumping flappers in the 20s. Um, uh, Olmsted Jr. does this incredible. Uh, again, the, the Washington Monument grounds are a li they're interesting because you've got the formal power of the obelisk, this enormous colossal obelisk, and you and it's not quite on center in either direction. It's always this design question. Uh, the Macmillan plan, of course, created these series of terraces and parterres. Uh, this is Olmsted's idea of creating something a little bit softer. Two great arc. This is the 16th Street axis. This is the now cr cranked by about one degree axis from the Capitol. Two enormous ovals. And of course, it's interesting that this does hold but isn't actually implemented as such, unlike uh, another part of it. This is um, now getting into the 30s, towards the end of the 30s. You can see now the, the Jefferson Memorial. This is actually Pope's scheme. It's, it's another one of these uh, uh, on a larger scale, that's another temple on a floating pavilion in the middle of the tidal basin. But you can see he was actually anticipating that that uh, plan for by Olmsted Jr. for the space. And of course, the dense planting. There's our there's our war memorial. And of course, in the end, that there's something here. Do I just click the bottom? Um, this is, of course, the scheme by John Russell Pope that was, this was enormously contentious, a, a really long story, which I don't want to get into, but in the, in the end, frankly, President Roosevelt pushed this through, the classical temple based on the, the Pantheon, and, and of course, the UVA Rotunda was the, uh, against objections from uh, many quarters, but it, this was built, and there you can see it. There's a little bit of a quality of a stage set here, which remains today in that you have these elements and entourage cherry trees and then you don't have to go too far until you start to hit all that brown stuff that's in the back of the of the Macmillan plan. So here we are um, looking west from the cap, uh, we're sort of above the capital looking west. Uh, you can see Memorial Bridge and all that has been put in. but. The actual implementation of that mall vision, those ordered rows of trees, again, it just doesn't happen until the mid-1930s. Now, the vision established for that precise treatment in 1901. So this is still the 30s. We've got a power plant in the middle of the mall. We've got all these, you know, these, these temporary buildings. At least they've, they've cleared the, the, the apartment buildings and stuff that had been put in on what this was um, called Maine and Missouri Avenues. And, you know, they, this is exactly the time when the jurisdiction of Union Square was actually transferred away from the Capitol and back over to what, what is now the Park Service. Uh, we've got uh, the... Uh, National Museum here, the Smithsonian Complex, Agricultural Building. I think I see that we have we no longer have the uh, the old ag. Is that correct? Anyway, it's it's roughly the early 30s. Um, looking the other, uh, I'm sorry, that is the same direction, but you can see that all that stuff in the foreground. It's still that hodgepodge, but uh, you know, wild random landscape. There's our power plant. Again. We got a lot of uses here. We got recreation in the foreground. We got industry in the middle ground. We've got, you know, <laughs> federal buildings on the right, you know. So to go back, uh, you know, at the other end, other end of the mall, this is, again, that image of Union Square trying to reconcile the, the Olmsted Senior plan for the Capitol with the sort of the power of that mall coming out of the, out of the base of the Capitol Hill. This is, this is Olmsted Jr.'s plan, which eventually worked itself around to be this kind of kidney-shaped element. We've got the, the Peace Monument. We've got the Garfield Memorial. This is the Capitol itself coming way down, uh, this element. This is this, is, uh, this wonderful statue uh, uh, grouping, uh, the, uh, the uh, Grant, Grant Memorial by uh, Henry, Merwin uh, Henry Merwin Schrady, hard to say. Uh, Complete around, I think, 1922. It's an amazing thing. This created a sort of, a, I think, a, 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 a sort of island setting for it. You know, it's, a, it's very long. It's three groups. It's actually very moving and definitely worth anybody's time to go look. Um, this is right before. You can see the, the, sh the statue, the, the grouping of the Grant Memorial in the foreground. And then, of course, after trying to really reconcile all sorts of things, the misalignment of the axis, 
the landscape, the change of the landscape, the, 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 the terracing of the capital. But this is a fairly compelling thing. And, 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 and uh, the Olmsted Junior landscape was implemented and was, was in place there for, for several decades. There's the Schrady, you can, it's hard to make out of this, but you've got Grant in the center and then these two elements on either side. There's a lot of little elements in this part of the mall that had to be brought together. The, the Mead Memorial here on the left is, of course, from the 20s, and we've got all sorts of things. This is actually a remnant tree taken by, a picture taken by Kay. This is a, a species of Zel, a rare species of Zelkova, which I think exists today, but there are these remnants from the botanical garden landscape, which are still in this part of the city. Well, by the mid-30s, between uh, 34 and 36, I believe, was the, the, the regrading and the implementation of those tree panels. This is right in front of the Smithsonian. Uh, you can see the cars, but they're starting to rework this whole landscape. There you can see it really under underway. This is the last. Uh, this stuff is still there, but coming down in 36. This, this is the last tempo on this end of the mall, which actually stays until the 71, but these all come out. So you're starting to get, you can just order it in position. That Macmillan idea, again, this is 1936 by their five. You know, this is, this is now a 30, 35 year old idea. We, we see the Civilian Conservation Corps working in the foreground. Um, a lot of changes happened uh, in mid-century, and I'm going to encapsulate many decades in a few slides because really not that much happened that was constructive in the in the way of the mall. But a lot of a lot of wider social change. First, again, the mall. A lot of things were happening. You have the cars, which become a big impact on the on the mall, and the the, you know, the creation of these these side roads for for automobiles. Uh, the the idea of mobility in American culture made possible. I think one of the key ideas is that this creation of this huge landscape as a unified space created a, a, a place for Americans to express themselves in a way that hadn't existed. And this was, made, this was sort of mediated by the technology of the day, radio, broadcast, newspapers, automobiles. People could get here and they could express themselves and be shown doing it. And those images and words could be transmitted. This doesn't, of course, it's not possible in 1895 in a way that it is now starting in the 30s. Um, again, the impact of the war. We've got incredible development, uh, temporary buildings all over West Potomac Park. They maintain the center, the, 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 the pools, but we still got these buildings left and right. And in, in not just the World War I tempos, but now we've got a whole line with twos with, from World War II with the little bridges connecting. But again, this social change allows all sorts of things to happen. We have the bonus marches uh, in the early 30s, shown on the left. We have Marian Anderson performing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in 1939. Fast forward into the you know, 50s and 60s, the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King making this amazing address, galvanizing the country from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in 1963. Uh, uh, and you know, this is a use that that just could not have been imagined. And of course, it's, it's, it's created because you've got the place to do it. I'm, so f moving very quickly, and I'm afraid I'm, am I, how am I doing? Am I right? Boy, all right, so the, the last 40 years and five minutes. Uh, <laughs> Skidmore owing uh, enormous ideas in the, starting in the mid-60s to actually uh, make sense of, uh, you know, where nothing really had happened. No new monuments had been built. SOM comes in and, tries to revive this thing. Of course, this is the anticipation of the bicentennial. This is, a re in some ways, a sort of a Macmillan Jr. in that there's a number of issues here. You have incredible geometric, uh, uh, it's, it's very uh, strong geometry, it, uh, or the order. It's really proposing to get rid of the cars on the mall, make for um, amenities uh, for, the, for the visitors, Dense plantings. We've seen these sort of ideas about very dense plantings. This is this is taken up. You see it really strongly here in this model. The idea was to frame the view that, that the malls and the, the the elms along the mall themselves were a little bit too scruffy. They're, these are now this is now 65. These these elm trees have been in only for 30 years, right? Only 30 years, which is weird. I mean, when I was a little kid visiting the mall at this time. You thought it had always been like that, but here, here we are. They, they wanted to put in, they wanted to put in these these uh, trees. To, you can see the line of trees lining the central thing, uh, the axis. 
And it actually starts to happen. This is a, a, a view from 19... 62, the tunneling of 12th Street under the mall. So again, there's this whole movement to actually get rid of the cars, just get rid of them, create this really strong pedestrian uh, idea. You, you see, in the, in, you can see the cars on the street when you get rid of those and turn them, these into pedestrian uh, spaces. Union Square uh, gets a, a whole, again, Union Square landscape has only been around for 30 something years, but it's completely re-envisioned. Re again, they've tunneled under the whole mall to create the uh, the, the set, what's called the center like freeway. This is this is the the original S O M scheme f uh, for that capital reflecting pool as a foreground. But of course, our poor uh, President Grant, somewhat Grant at sea here, he's sort of lost in that big. Uh, and you can see the scale of it, the very big rolled edge, which you're probably familiar with. It's a, it's a very enormous scale, and you can you can see how it works here in the foreground. There's that tunnel going under the botanical garden, and of course, sort of curving right under that space. Um, further iterations of the plan. I don't know if you remember that the very rigid idea for the the, the west over here, the the um, gardens here. Uh, this is much looser starts to s imagine uh, as more of a sequence of spaces. Created. This is an overlay of the, what was the, the Macmillan kite plan uh, over this, and it creates certain hot spots. This, of course, became very influential because it was the location for the FDR memorial. This is an idea for Constitution Gardens as a the, the sort of derived from the Tivoli as a sort of a pleasure garden, again, uh, on a European model with all these little, little interesting spaces. This was abandoned as an idea for a different concept. Uh, at one end, uh, a, a sort of what's well, it's affectionately known as the beer pavilion. I don't know if that's the, the official word, but it was a pavilion overlooking Constitution Gardens. This is its construction. It's act right at about the time of its dedication. Um, and this is begins to be about commemorating. This is this is a little island dedicated to the signers of the of the Declaration. And here is that landscape. And we come to a kind of a transition. At this point, it's safe. To, I think it's reasonable to say that the, that that Macmillan vision has actually been largely achieved, and we go immediately, immediately into this new use idea of of what are we going to do with some of these spaces? We've got this. You know, this th this design has never quite been achieved, but we certainly got the, the, this mall taken care of. Um, this is now all the tempos finally removed, and you've got. I think in the eyes of some, a blank canvas for other uses. Immediately, uh, the Viet Vietnam Veterans Memorial is, is, is designed and placed there. And it changes everything in terms of the use and really, and literally the typology of memorials in, in the mall and possibly you know, in a wider context. It is revolutionary in that it is a horizontal memorial. It, is, um, it establishes a new vocabulary. It is no longer the upright, um, aspirational idea of a mo of a monument, but it is actually more experiential, horizontal. Some would say funereal. Um, there it is, people walking along. It just establishes this vocabulary: the wall, the inscriptions. Eventually, um, you know, connection to the wider landscape. Eventually, sculpture gets added. This becomes sort of a formula. A Korean War Memorial in the 80s, on a on a same site inscription wall statues fdr in that in that spot again this is this is a little bit different uh, this is this was a 39 year project starting in the late 50s and completed in the late 90s uh, but a sequence of spaces but again with some of the same elements the walls the inscriptions the statues um, all n n not necessarily one one uh, in, in dominance of the other. And of course, the, the most contentious one of the probably of the late uh, century was the World War II Memorial, um, right in the middle of the mall. Uh, this is the Rainbow Pool, again, from the 30s. The, what was interesting about this, it was another trend that we've been seeing is the conflation of memorials with memorials with museums. And so one of the issues here was the, was the incorporation of program which drove this idea of these enormous berms defining that space in the middle of the mall. The, well, the museum program was cut, but the idea stayed. So we, st st we still have that, that formal idea um, in the middle of the mall, again, with all these elements. 
Um, the most recent addition, of course, Martin Luther King, uh, it has most of the same elements of the curving walls, statue, inscriptions, water elements, just, uh, just opened this fall, so you should definitely go see that. Um, very quickly, new issues today. Security has been enormous for us to try to grapple and try to figure out how to tame these issues. This is all pictures of these major three memorials in the last 10 years with temporary security. Uh, Lori Olin's plan um, about uh, 2001 or two uh, basically tried to solve that problem. The base of the monument, the design, drawing on certain uh, aspects of, of, of these old, uh, historic aspects of the landscape in a way that couldn't be seen. So the, these, these ovals somewhat relate to the, 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 the landscape elements. Um, there it is. The walls treated as ha-has, so they aren't, aren't as visible. A related thing that you might know about, Olin also recently designed this. This, uh, this is, of course, where the fish ponds used to be. This is now part of this levee system and creates a, a cutoff for floodwaters on 17th Street, which is being built right now. More security. This was an enormous uh, discussion at the Commission of Fine Arts to figure out how to how to provide security across the front of the Lincoln Memorial. But we ended up using uh, the, the the final solution here uh, was Sasaki's uh, to help actually use the reflecting pool as part of the perimeter, and then these small walls and bar bollard barriers over there. We're looking uh, at ideas for the Jefferson as well. This is more of a, of a landscape design, or so, something in the landscape. Um, the last thing that's being added to this is, of course, the African American History and Culture Museum in the Smithsonian, part of the Washington Monument grounds, but uh, clearly you know, trying to draw on that curvilinear uh, landscape, but needing to define its own space. It's the image by David Ajay and Associates and the, the whole design team with Catherine Gustafson. Um, as a little designer. Quickly, uh, the other planning work, uh, just want to mention the National Capital Framework Plan. Uh, this came out in, in 2009. Not exactly for the mall itself, but done concurrently with the National Mall Plan. What it does introduce are a couple of things. One is to create more locations for commemorative elements and museums. So it's all about the areas actually framing the mall and creating more connections between the city and the mall. Probably the most important issue here is trying to create a connection from the mall down to the waterfront and ideas about that. Um, this is the uh, rendered, but what you can see is this mess behind the, the Jefferson re-envisioned as a festival grounds or East Potomac Park along the channel restored as a wetland. So in closing, you know, everybody understands how the mall needs to be used on certain occasions, the 4th of July, presidential inaugurations. Um, these are all competing uses that continue to change over time. Uh, but I think that the challenge here is to figure out uh, how to do it while keeping, keeping the big idea in mind, but paying attention to these details. Thank you.